Okay, hello everyone. Um, right, we're going to do utilitarianism today, and I know that a lot of you have been looking forward to this, thinking that this is, a, this is a, an ethical theory you know something about. Okay, oh, what happened then? Right, last week, we'll do a bit of revision, as always, um, we learnt about the categorical and hypothetical imperative. So, who can tell me the difference between a hypothetical and a categorical imperative? Come on, some brave person. Hypothetical is our desires, and, and categorical is because we believe we should do it. Yes, OK. Um, I, I would try to make that a little more precise, but, but I completely see where you're going. The hypothetical imperative is an imperative that is conditional upon our having a certain desire. So if you remember, I said, um, if I want to go to London, or if I want to get to London by 12, um, and I believe I've got to catch the 10 o'clock train to get there by 12, then I'm rationally bound to catch the 10 o'clock as long as I have that desire and that belief. But the categorical imperative, um, Kant claims you can derive the imperative, the should statement, directly from a belief. So no desire is needed, because if you believe it is wrong to do something, then you will also believe, he says, that you shouldn't do it. And you don't need any desire not to do it, because um, anyone who thinks that they need a desire to do the right thing implies that they might not desire to do the right thing. And in making that implication, they demonstrate that they don't have the properly moral concept. Because what Kant thinks is that the concepts right and wrong, and concepts are constituents of belief contents, uh, so the concepts of right and wrong are intrinsically action-guiding. They're the only concepts that are, and therefore they're the only concepts that, when they feature in a belief, don't need a desire to, to motivate action immediately and in and of themselves. So that's the difference between the categorical and the hypothetical imperative. And we looked at whether the categorical imperative is central to morality, and Kant, of course, thinks it is central to morality because it, the only actions that are moral actions are actions that are performed on the basis of categorical imperatives. If an action is performed on the basis of, of a hypothetical imperative, it may conform to the moral law. In other words, no one's saying it's immoral or even non-moral. It may conform to the moral law but the person who um, performed it was not, in performing it, acting morally. Uh, and the reason they weren't is because they, they were acting in order to satisfy an inclination of their own. So if at the checkout the uh, person gives me too much change and I hand it back, um, it's an interest. I've done something that conforms to the moral law, but if I did it to impress the person in the queue behind me, then I am not acting morally. If I did it because I thought it was the right thing to do, then I am acting morally. Not only does my action conform to the moral law, but I act morally in performing it. Um, we then looked at Hume's account of moral motivation, and we compared it to Kant's, and Hume, if you remember, thinks all actions are motivated by passions, that uh, reason is causally inert, that reason cannot, in and of itself, cause any action. So we see an immediate clash between um, Aris, uh, sorry, Kant and Hume, because Kant would go along with Hume completely on every type of behaviour except moral behaviour, every type of action except moral action. Then we looked at the difference between Kant and Aristotle. Can anyone remember what that was? I mean, there are lots of differences between Kant and Aristotle, but we looked at a particular one. No, you're all invading my eye again. Happiness as being the horse, eudaimonia as being the guiding, as it's been the most important thing. This is, this is the thing that guides moral, moral behaviour, whereas Kant would say it, 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 it may be the result of moral behaviour, but it's not actually instrumental in producing it. It's, it's not the goal of it. Well, um, 
OK, I see where you're coming from. You're absolutely in the right ballpark. Actually, Aristotle, too, doesn't think that um, virtue is a means to the end of happiness. In fact, he thinks that anyone who tries to act in accordance with virtue in order to achieve happiness has missed the point. Um, because they may be doing the right thing, but they're not doing it for the right reason. Um, so actually, in that, Aristotle and Kant are really rather similar. Um, Kant says that what's important is not happiness, but whether you're worthy of happiness. And he thinks that you might be worthy of happiness without actually being happy. Um, he actually thinks that someone who exercises reason well in the way that Aristotle recommends might actually be miserable. Um, because sometimes people who don't exercise reason are better off than people who do. Yeah. But of course, we've got a big problem in looking at that because happiness is such a bad um, interpretation of Aristotle's eudaimonia um, that actually when you look at properly at what eudaimonia is, um, it starts to make happiness look to be the wrong interpretation anyway. Um, so if you look closely at Kant and Aristotle here, the key difference is just that Aristotle, so, I'm sorry, Kant would um, insist that you have to be worthy of happiness, worthy of eudaimonia. But actually, if you look at what eudaimonia is, could you achieve eudaimonia in Aristotle's terms without being worthy of it? Probably not. Probably not. But very definite no from Joan there. Joan, have I got that right? Well done, me. <laughs> OK, and then finally, we reflected on whether to side with Kant or Hume. And we had a room full of um, Kantians last week. Do we still have that after a, after a week's reflection? Who's with Hume? OK, a few of you. Who's with Kant? No, we've still got a room full of Kantians. OK, well, let's see if we can change that today. OK, this is what we're going to do this week. I'll let you read that yourselves. OK, right. So we're looking at consequentialist theories now, or we're looking at a particular consequentialist theory. Um, and what a consequentialist theory does is it evaluates the moral worth of actions by looking at their consequences. And do you remember I said last week that an action always has the same structure loosely? It's... Um, always got an intention, there's the action itself, and there are always consequences of actions. I don't know why I draw circles here, but, uh, but I just do. There's no, there's no meaning whatsoever in the circles. It's just there need to be these three elements with respect to an action. If an action isn't intentional, then it's not actually an action at all. It's just behaviour, like tripping over the carpet. Um, if it's an action, there's got to be an intention as in pretending to trip over the carpet. But all actions, of course, have consequences. You don't perform an action that, that doesn't have some consequence or other. And the consequentialist, as you would expect from his name, is evaluating actions in terms of the consequences of the action, whereas Kant is evaluating the action in terms of its intention. So very different emphasis from a consequentialist. Uh, the most famous consequentialist theory is probably utilitarianism. Utilitarianism thinks that it's the consequences in terms of happiness or utility that matter, not consequences of any other kind. It's all very well looking at the consequences. There are lots of different ways in which you might think of consequences, but the utilitarian is looking at the consequences in terms of the consequences for happiness, as we shall see in a minute. We'll be more precise in a minute. Um, libertarianism is another form of consequentialism that looks at the consequences of an action in terms of liberty. Um, so that is another way of being a consequentialist, but without being a utilitarian. OK, utilitarianism is the view that the right action is the action that produces or tends to produce, and, and that or is going to become quite important later, 
or tends to produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Now, that's the last time I think that you're going to see this written out loud because <laughs> uh, written, written out loud, you see what I mean. <laughs> um, it's just too long to type. So you get GHGP, GN from now on. OK, so the right action is that which produces the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Um, now, I think if you remember back to, to Hume and Kant and Aristotle, um, that's the first time probably you've got something really rather useful in that section of my presentation, isn't it? So first you get, what did Aristotle say? The right action is the action... No, that's right. Exactly. The right action is the one that would be performed by a virtuous person. And Hume said the right action is the that's right. The action that a true judge would feel approbation for. My syntax getting in a bit of a mess there. Um, and Kant says the right action is that which accords with the moral law. Um, so you need to know what the moral law is. But the right action is that which produces or tends to produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. So we need to know what that means. We're going to be looking at the views of a particular utilitarian, John Stuart Mill, um, who's probably the most famous utilitarian. Um, maybe not. Uh, he's not the person who initiated the theory. Utilitarianism was introduced by his father, James Mill, and by Jeremy Bentham um, and Sidgwick, other, other people. But Mill may be the most famous proponent, but he wasn't one of the initiators. Um, Mill's argument for utilitarianism, his fish, uh, official one, um, is, looks rather shaky. Um, we're not going to discuss the official one, but I'll say in a minute why it looks rather shaky. What we're going to be looking at is, is what appears to be rather stronger, his unofficial argument for utilitarianism. Here's the official one. Um, as the only thing each of us desires is happiness, we all desire the general happiness. Happiness, therefore, is the ultimate end of human conduct and the standard of morality. OK, we've done enough logic by now to be able to have a look at that argument. Tell me what a few problems are with it. If I desire my happiness, I don't see it follows that I desire the general happiness. Absolutely. Where does that come from? Where does that move come from? I, I might desire to make myself happy, but why should I care about your happiness? Um, if I care about you, then maybe I have a reason to care about your happiness. But your interest in your own happiness is no reason for, for me to be interested in your happiness, is it? So that's the, the first odd move is from we each desire our own happiness, therefore we desire the general happiness. We, we might all desire a general happiness, but that doesn't mean to say it's the ultimate end. There might be something else completely independently that's the ultimate end. Even if we all do desire general happiness, that doesn't mean it's the only thing we desire. Maybe there are other things. What other things might we desire apart from happiness? Meta happiness. Oh, meta happiness. What's that? Beyond happiness. And, and what's that? Why, I don't Why know. might it's I not, desire that? It's not that? easy to. Uh, it's ineffable. Oh, right, OK. Well, leaving out ineffable things, <laughs> given that they're things we can't talk about, that being what ineffable means, um, what else might we desire what, other than happiness? What about perfection? Uh, perfection, yes, we might desire perfection. Health, Health yep. Liberty? Liberty, OK. The, the, on the surface of it, it would appear to be that there are a lot of things we desire as well as happiness. Um, and that's as well as our own happiness, never mind the happiness of others, uh, general happiness. So, the, I mean, it's very easy to pick a lot of holes in this official argument. Um, so, and here, uh, I think we got all of these. Even if we do desire happiness, does this mean it's the only thing we desire? Um, does it mean that we desire the general happiness? And actually, we didn't get this one. Um, we, if we're talking about morality here, the fact that we do desire happiness doesn't mean that we ought to desire happiness. And if the utilitarian is, is talking about 
the pursuit of the greatest happiness to the greatest number as being the measure of morality, where does that come in? The fact that we do desire happiness doesn't mean we ought to desire happiness. As Hume told us that you can't go from an is to an ought. Um, so lots of problems on the surface of it with that argument. You'll just have to take my word for it that the argument isn't as shaky as it seems. There have been reams written about this argument um, and some of the arguments are very good to, to give different glosses on it which make it look as if Hume, sorry, Mill, isn't making the egregious mistakes that he looks as if he's making. And it's always worrying to attribute to a very good philosopher egregious mistakes. You should always have warning bells ringing very loudly if you're thinking what an idiotic thing to say of someone who's proven himself in so many ways. So it isn't as, as, as shaky as it seems, but we're going to look at the other uh, argument that he relies on in several places, but never actually makes explicit. Utilitarian explains why it's implausible to think that our everyday moral rules are absolute truths. Do you remember in week one, we looked at absolutism and we looked at um, whether we thought that any of our ordinary everyday moral rules are absolutely true. So um, you get things like don't lie. Well, OK, we all believe that you shouldn't lie, but do we believe it as an absolute truth? Do we believe that it's always and everywhere true? No, we don't. I mean, we only have to think about when the Nazis come to the door and say, are there any Jews here? <laughs> it, it looks as if it's your moral duty at this point to lie, um, rather than your moral duty not to lie. Um, so even if we leave aside whether that really is the case, um, it certainly looks as if it is. Um, and given, I mean, actually, even if you take don't kill, you can find oh, counterexamples. Yeah. Did I see a question down here somewhere? No? Nope. OK. Um, so the fact there are exceptions to all our everyday rules demonstrates, according to Mill, that it's not to these rules we should look in deciding what to do. Um, I should add there that he, he's absolutely not against their being used as rules of thumb. In other words, we use them because they're useful. Um, but he doesn't think that we should use them as moral absolutes, as being always and everywhere true. So instead, what he wants us to look towards is the greatest happiness principle, the GHP. Um, <laughs> again, you can see why I'm using GHP. OK, the greatest happiness principle tells us that the right action is the action that produces the greatest happiness of the greatest number. OK, so the greatest happiness principle is central to utilitarianism and it encapsulates the, the utilitarian claim that the right action is the action that produces or tends to produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. And again, looking back to the first week, we looked at lower order absolutism which believes that things like don't lie, don't kill are moral absolutes. And we looked at higher order absolutism, which um, is that things like produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number or treat others always as ends are moral absolutes. Do you remember? So utilitarianism is an absolutist theory, not a relativistic theory, as lots of people think. And the reason it's an absolutist theory is that it thinks that you should produce the greatest happiness to the greatest number is absolutely true. Um, or the right action that produces, is the action that produces the greatest happiness to the greatest number is absolutely true. True everywhere, for everyone, at every time. So let's move on at the moment. OK, in order to understand utilitarianism properly, we need to understand what the greatest happiness principle means, whether there are counterexamples to the utilitarian claim, and whether the greatest happiness principle is practical. Um, lots of people think it, it actually isn't practical. Actually, I've just realised I haven't covered this argument, so I may as well just mention it now. Lots of people think that um, utilitarianism is impractical uh, because we can't... How can we measure happiness? How, how can we... I mean, I know how to get my ruler out and measure feet and inches and things. Ooh, showing my age there. Um, but how do I get out my tape measure and measure <laughs> happiness? Well, what's your response to this? Well, take a camera and take a picture. 
Uh, I'm not interested in David Cameron's beliefs. <laughs> Not right now. You can make an estimate of, 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 you can estimate how you think it's going to turn out. Now, you may not be right, you may be wrong, but if you were going to go along with this, and I don't necessarily, it would be strange to estimate, you know, go for something which you, in your estimation, is a lower amount of happiness than... And, and you're implying thing. that you think it's quite easy for us to, no, no, to estimate no, happiness? No, I'm not saying it is, is easy. It's right. Well. well, that's what I'm asking. No, Some people no, think no. that we can know now that it's not possible to measure happiness. Did I see a formulation of this statement which made it time critical? Was, was there a phrase at this point in time? No. Certainly not in my presentation, there isn't. No, no I thought in the book. Um, there was some discussion. You, you, you didn't have to work out the greatest happiness to the infinite future uh, yes that's looking at no what you're looking at is the greatest happiness to the greatest number and what i'm asking is is it possible for us to estimate values of happiness to measure relative no. happiness well the problem is surely that you can have the minority with the moral right and, and the majority were morally right by other um Measurements. And I'm mean, I mean, thinking of, of um, you know, the Nazi Jew. Or the yeah, can I stop you there? Because I'm asking a very specific question, um, and, and I'm not sure you're answering it there. Forgive me if I'm wrong about this, but the question is are, can we measure other people's happiness? There have been uh, happiness in the Indi indices over the EU. Uh, happiness uh, indices. Yes, yeah. Right, okay. There are also qualies. Has anyone heard of qualies? Yeah. Um, quality adjusted life years in the NHS. Yeah. You're a doctor, aren't yeah. you? Yes. Well, we tell we them what it is. We have to do crap calculations on So, the what's a quali in? How? You, you try and estimate, um, you, you, you say by a course of action that you will increase the life of someone by a year. And you will actually say, but is it a quality? life year. So if you increase someone's quality of life by 50% for two years, then that would equal one quality life year. You would actually produce some index. And actually, you actually try and work out how much it costs to produce mm -hmm. one quality life year. And then you would actually decide whether somebody had treatment on the basis of um, whether you were achieving a certain number of quality life years for a certain amount of money. That's right. So a quali is a quality adjusted life year. So if I'm going to, so this intervention I can do for you is going to give you two years at a certain quality, and the one I can do for you is going to give you three years at a lower quali quality. Um, I can I can work out which intervention, given that I can't afford both, I should be able to. Well, what is that apart from measuring happiness or quality of life? If we're assuming quality of life is happiness. Um, so um, these, there are definitely people who do think you can. And actually, it seems to me obvious we can. If, if I know that um, Chris broke up with his girlfriend last night, then I, I'm prepared to guess he's miserable. Um, it depends how he looks when he tells me. He's grinning now. <laughs> I mean, if he looks at me and he says, Whoa, I broke up last night, then, then I'm going to revise my estimate. But most people, when they break up with somebody, even if, if they wanted to, uh, can be quite miserable. I can also guess that if I come down and kick you in the shin quite hard, this is not going to make you happy. I mean, we're actually quite good at knowing what makes other human beings happy or not. And actually, if we think back to the moral dilemma that we looked at in the first week, do you remember when your mum comes home from the hairdresser and says, what do you think? And you think, yuck. Um, well, aren't you there looking quite a lot at what's going to make her happy over the long term, over the short term, da-da, da-da? And again, this is, these are judgments that we make all the time. If we think of all measurements as scientific me measurements, then we'll think it's going to be very difficult to, to evaluate happiness unless we really go for qualities. And actually, if you look at qualities, how is quality of life estimated? Answer by the subjective assessment of, of the in doctors or people who make these judgments about other people's lives. Certainly not an objective measure, which is what qualities claim to be. Um, so I, I think the practical objection to utilitarianism, which is that we can't measure happiness, um, thinks of measurement too much in a scientific way. Actually, human beings are a good measure 
of other human beings. Uh, I, if I, I can see understanding as it dawns on your face. If you ask me how I can do that, the answer is I don't know. But do you deny that I can see it? Yeah. So I'm a good measure of your understanding um, without being, in any sense, a scientific measure. OK, so these are things that we need to know in order to understand utilitarianism. Um, for a first thing, a utilitarian, an action is right only if it produces the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Very important. It doesn't require that uh, an agent must intend to produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Um, you can produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number without intending to. You might, do it, might, you might have been intending to do quite the opposite, do it by mistake. But imagine that you're acting immorally if you relax with a cup of tea instead of doing a voluntary stint at the Oxfam shop. I mean, if, if the only time an action is right is when we are intending to produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number, how could you ever morally relax with a cup of tea when you could be doing some voluntary work? Do you see what I mean? So, so you've got to make a distinction between a prescriptive theory you should try and produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number, and a descriptive theory which says when you act rightly, what you do is produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Do you see the difference? The prescriptive theory says you must intend to do it. The descriptive theory says whether you intend to or not, if you succeed, you have acted rightly. See the difference? Okay. Um, we noticed that Aristotle, whether, whether he thought the act or the agents came first, was, was a bit of an open question. This is not knocking Aristotle. He, he was working a very long time ago. Um, but our other agents have focused primarily on the agent and his reasons for acting. And the utilitarian shifts our focus very definitely to the action itself and to the consequences, not to the agent and his or her intentions or reasons. What we're looking at is the action. So here's an exercise for you. So Tom takes his elderly aunt out for tea, and unfortunately, as they cross the road, she's run over. Um, I want you to tell me what you think a utilitarian would have to say about Tom's action, whether it's right or wrong, and about what you think about the action. So give it a thought for 20 seconds or so. I don't think you need more than that. OK, that's enough. So what do you think a utilitarian would have to think? Wrong. wrong yeah. That it's wrong? Yeah. OK. And what do you think? Well, you think he's a nice chap? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, sorry, what did you say? That he was run over. It could have been a bad driver. How is he either... Okay. It's not now, Peter. We don't know what the situation was. What, what do you think about Tom's action? Was it the right action or not? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. think it was. it was. Why do you think it was? Well, it was his intentions were good. Okay, but the consequences were bad. If you're a utilitarian, you're only concerned about the consequences. Um, therefore, you you must still say that the action was wrong. But the utilitarian. Sorry. Sorry. Quick. What about the consequences for the lady? For the lady, what the one who was run over? Yeah, if you're looking at the round, the consequences weren't good for her, were they? Well, but that's exactly what that's. <laughs> she may have gone to a better place. Let's leave on one side the possibility of her going to a better place, and let's assume <laughs> that she's not very happy as a result of being run over, <laughs> or at least she's less happy than she was before. OK, but you're absolutely right that what's important for the utilitarian is he is not seeking to produce his own happiness or the happiness of those immediately around him or of those he loves. He's seeking to produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. And that means everyone in space and time who's going to be affected by the action. Um, so if you can think that your action is going to have consequences that ripple out over time and over space and you must think of the everyone who's likely to be affected by the, that action 
in order to decide whether it's going to produce the greatest happiness for the greatest number or not. OK, so um, looking then, we, we seem to have a problem then with utilitarianism. Tom had very good intentions in taking his old aunt out for tea. Um, she got run over, so the consequences of his action have been bad. Absolutely unequivocal from a utilitarian point of view, that was the wrong thing to do. This was the wrong action. This all feels a bit wrong. Surely Tom was a nice chap. His intentions were good. But the utilitarian can rely on the same thing that we've looked at in, in several of the people we've looked at, the distinction between the moral evaluation of an agent and the moral evaluation of an action. And although that the utilitarian looks at the consequence of an action to evaluate the action, he doesn't have to look at that to evaluate the agent, if you see what I mean. He can evaluate the agent by the agent's intention to produce the best consequences. And if Tom's action had had the consequences he might reasonably have expected it to have, it would have produced the greatest happiness the greatest number, wouldn't it? <laughs> And therefore, you can't fault Tom for, his, for what he intended to do. Unfortunately, because of what actually happened, we have to evaluate his action as morally wrong. And this is where um, you see that it's very easy in thinking about an action to, to confuse these three things, to actually think of the three things as coming together. If you're thinking of an action in terms of its intentions, as Kant would want you to, you're not doing the utilitarian thing. You must be looking at an agent in terms of the intentions, but an action in terms of its consequences. You with me? So I suppose the question that raises for me is what's the utility of, of worrying about the actions? I mean, presumably we're getting, getting it onto this. And it's sort of so what? What so what? Well, that, that whether or not the actions produce the greatest good or not. Um, I'm sorry, that's if, the whole point. Yeah, no, <laughs> if, they, if they do produce the greatest good, they're right, morally right, and if they don't, they're morally wrong. And, and, I, and I suppose, and, and you're probably going to cover this, it, it doesn't seem to be a very useful concept if, if they are purely, if we're purely focusing on the actions. So I, I think you're a bit wrong about that, actually. Let, well, I think I probably am covering it, so, yeah, so let me yeah. move on. One more question Tom, here. Tom could have taken a slightly different action by parking on double yellow line right outside the tea shop so she wouldn't have to cross the road. Um, yes, <laughs> and? <laughs> <laughs> well, that would have produced great happiness for, for both of them. Um, and do you think that he will have acted rightly if he did yeah, that? Of course, you're then looking at the action of parking on double yeah. yellow lines, aren't you? Which is a slightly different action. Um, let's move on a bit. We'll, we'll come back. OK, the claim that the right action is that which produces or tends to produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number. Look, I've written this out in full again. I must be mad. Um, it's a multiply ambiguous claim. Huge number of ambiguities. Can anyone find any? before I tell you what they are, or tell you what some of them are. Why, why is it multiply ambiguous? How do you count the number? How do you the number? Uh, yes, what do you mean by number here? How, how many, are we talking about the total number or the average number of people? You might uh, do something which increases the happiness immediately, but in the long term decreases the happiness. Um, I don't know that that's not covered by this, actually. Um, I mean, because what it's got to do is produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number, full stop. Um, and if in the long term it doesn't produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number, then, then there's your answer, isn't it? Um, you, uh, there may be, we may make wrong judgments. Don't forget our judgments are, to some extent, irrelevant here, because... What counts is whether it does produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number or not, not whether we believe it does. I mean, obviously, in our intentions, it's whether we believe it does or not that, that counts. But somebody is judging in the end, you know, if we're not able to judge. No, why do you think that? Well, because that's how you're going to quantify the right action. We can't No, let, let's not confuse epistemology and metaphysics here. I'm going to use this later, but I may as well introduce it now. Dropping the bomb on Hiroshima, was that the right thing to do or not? Well, 
answer. It was the right thing to do if it produced the greatest happiness of the greatest number. It wasn't the right thing to do if it didn't produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Do we know whether it produced the greatest happiness of the greatest number or not? Probably not. There is a fact of the matter quite irrespective of whether we know what that fact is. Do you see what I mean? But if we never know the fact, then the argument's superfluous, isn't it? The utilitarian well, do you argument really think becomes superfluous. No, we usually know, but occasionally there will be times when we don't know. Um, does that perfect. stop it being true? I mean, there may be things out there that are true of which we know nothing. Yeah. Does that make it any less true? No. These things might matter a great deal to us. I mean, it's either true or it's not true that there's a, there's a meteorite hurtling towards Earth at the moment. I tell you what, <laughs> the fact that we don't know that there is is completely irrelevant to whether it matters to us or not. Mm. If there is, it really does matter. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, uh, when we say the right action, are we talking about the particular action of this particular time? Well, that's something I'll get on to, because yeah. another thing we might... Oh, I'm sorry, is that yeah, what you're offering as another ambiguity? Yeah. You know, yeah. this Tom took this arm to that T-shirt. Yeah. And then you've got all it tends to produce, suggests so you're actually looking at all the Toms with all their arts to all the T-shirts. Yeah, so. or all of us with all our arts, yes. And, and is that what tends mean here? Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so another ambiguity of the, the greatest happiness principle is precisely that. Are we talking about type actions or token actions? Um, that makes quite a big difference. Um, any other ambiguities you can see here? If I try and visualise this as a picture, this Ooh. statement, isn't it some sort of a graph? Please pick a visual imagination. If we have, you know, 40% of the people being 80% happy, I'm sort of with the doctor here and his <laughs> yeah. colleagues. You know, I can't quite understand what that means. Does it mean if there are more people with slightly less happiness, it's better than slightly fewer people with slightly more happiness? Isn't that ambiguous? <laughs> yes. Uh, you're absolutely right, but that goes back to the first ambiguity we mentioned, which was, do we mean total number of people who are happy, or average number of people, or da-da-da-da. You're, you're doing very well. Okay, here are we. So are we talking about action tokens or action types? Um, we might ask, what do we mean by happiness here? Because actually the word happiness, as we've seen, is multiply ambiguous in itself. Um, do we mean the greatest total or the greatest average happiness? So let's, let's imagine that, um, sorry, what's your name? Roz. Roz. OK, let's imagine that Roz is one of these people who, who delightfully is capable of huge happiness. She gets really, really happy when she's happy. The rest of you are miserable buckers. <laughs> um, now, what should I do? I could, by concentrating on her, raise the happiness levels in this room massively. And I could put a lot of effort into the rest of you and raise it only a tiny bit. Well, what am I going to do? Concentrate on her? I think so. <laughs> um, so do you, do you see where we get, where, where, what, what do we actually mean by the greatest number, um, the greatest happiness of the greatest number? Um, the, another thing we might ask about this is um, the greatest number of what? I mean, could Hitler have been a really good utilitarian? It's just that he didn't count Jews. OK, yes, we've had a, a straightforward and sincere yes. It, it could be. I mean, some, if you don't count women, um, oh, then your actions are going to be very different from if you do count women. Oh, if you don't count animals, yes, then your actions are going to be very different again, aren't they? If animals don't count, then vegetarian is going to, vegetarianism is going to look very different from if animals yes. do count, isn't it? So actually, they're huge changes in, in the implications of utilitarianism, depending on, on what you mean by these things. And, and the statement just in itself is multiply ambiguous. Um, and some people have thought of uh, utilitarianism as a slippery theory because of this. They, they sort of think, well, you know, the trouble with utilitarianism, every time there's an objection to it, people redefine it. Um, and it gets away from the objection. But I, do, I don't think that this is a good objection. Can anyone see why it's not a good objection? That it's, you see, it's not slippery. I mean, it's not good. Yes, why um, is this not a good objection? Well, I mean, that's because it's slippery thought. I mean, you just think, oh, what 
all, all theories are developed all the time. Mm -hmm. So everything will change. Good. That, that's exactly right. It's not a good objection because if utilitarianism <laughs> on some interpretation is the right moral theory, then it's our duty to find the interpretation yeah. that works, isn't it? Um, and if there are 101 interpretations, yeah. then we need to look at 101 different theories in order to see if any of them are right, because our aim is to find the right theory, um, not just to find one that isn't ambiguous. OK, we're going to look um, in what we do from now on at, at just two different interpretations. Firstly, we're going to look at the interpretation of happiness, what happiness means. And then we're, we're going to look at um, act versus rule utilitarianism. That's type or token actions. So let's start with looking at the nature of happiness. Um, Mill's notion of happiness is much simpler than Aristotle's. Here it is. By happiness is intended pleasure and the absence of pain. By unhappiness, pain and the privation of pleasure. Couldn't get much simpler than that, could you? And when you think of the hours that we spent on eudaimonia, <laughs> it, well, it shows you again, actually, that eudaimonia is not well translated as happiness. OK, but there's a disagreement between utilitarians about whether it's only the quantity of happiness that should be counted or also its quali quality. So um, Jeremy Bentham, for example, thought that it was only the quantity. So he would think, for example, that, um, well, he thought that pushpin is as good as poetry. Pushpin is, I assume, some sort of table football or something. I've no idea what it is, but you can imagine. Um, and you might think, well, Pushpin is as good as poetry. Um, you could only claim that poetry was better from Bentham's point of view by saying, actually, if I write a poem, I might give... <laughs> actually, this is hugely unlikely, but I might give all of you huge pleasure, and therefore there would be more happiness caused by my writing a poem than there would be by my playing a game of pushpin. And in that sense... Um, writing poetry may be better than pushpin, but there's no sense whatsoever that playing pushpin is any worse than poetry uh, in terms of the quality of the happiness that it produces. So according to Bentham, the, it's the quantity of happiness that matters, not its quality. Da-da, da-da, da-da. OK, but Mill believed that we've got to also look at the quality of happiness. Um, so he categorised pleasures into higher and lower pleasures. And he argued that anyone capable of experiencing both would always choose the higher pleasure over the lower pleasure. Now, this obviously suits you lot, because here you are attending a philosophy lecture instead of having a nap after lunch <laughs> or, or something like that. You, you might have had a nap after lunch or you might have had an extra glass of wine with lunch and be pleasantly woozy. Well, you might, or you might still be doing that. <laughs> but, uh, but here you are attending a philosophy lecture and that's presumably because you think that you get more pleasure out of attending a philosophy lecture than you would from having a nap after lunch. Uh, and Mill goes along with that completely. He would think that... that Attending a philosophy lecture is a higher pleasure than having a nap after lunch. OK, now this has caused... Um, oh, OK, OK, the way Mill expresses it. So Bentham thinks that push, pushpin is as good as poetry, but Mill thinks that it's better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool, and sometimes it's, he says, a pig, than a fool, than a pig satisfied. And... Let's see if we agree with this. OK, think about it for a second so I find out what my next slide is so I don't tell you what it says. Um, OK, yeah. What do you think? Are you with Bentham here or are you with Mill? Mill. OK, put your hand up if it's Mill. Put your hand up if it's Bentham. OK, right. Uh, Bentham, why Bentham? Why, why is it only quality that matters? Well, I think it's very judgmental. You know, you said it's all right for us, we prefer philosophy to a nap. But if you go to a bingo hall, you could stand in front of them and say, well, it's okay for you, you obviously prefer bingo, it's your highest pleasure. 
mm. to, to having a nap. You know, it's very judgmental on what pleasures are to say. Okay, so so opinion. you think Mills are a, a vic nasty Victorian elitist sort yeah, of thing? Yeah. yeah. It yeah. Smells a bit like. That. Okay, is that what the rest of you, who who are go for Bentham think? I think Mill also said that to, in order to be able to make a choice, that you needed to have appreciated or experienced both yeah. the higher pleasure and the lower pleasure. And I think that's the difficulty with the bingo thing, that maybe if those people at bingo came to the philosophy lecture, they would enjoy that more. Well, so you've got... Um, perhaps in pursuit of what you're saying here, um, what if somebody who came, instead of coming to the um, bingo, came to the philosophy lecture and, lecture and it went right over their heads, just didn't understand a word of it? I mean, w w that will happen with some people. Yeah, I think that is the um, problem, because... You, in order to appreciate or have experience the higher grade pleasures, usually you've got to be educated, haven't you? Um, yes, well, that's another reason that people think that Mill is an elitist. That he thinks that you can't actually experience pleasure properly unless you're educated. Um, it's certainly the case that um, Mill says... You, uh, I think, did I say something about competent judges? Not... Hume's true judge, but Mill's competent judge. A competent judge is somebody who's having experienced both the higher and the lower pleasures, is aware that the higher pleasures have a greater quality than the lower pleasures. So we all know that it's nice to have a nap after lunch. We all know that it's nice to have an extra glass of wine at lunch. But we all also know that it's nicer to finish that philosophy lecture and, uh, sorry, finish that philosophy essay and get a good mark for it. And uh, what Mill would say is that we know this because we're competent judges. Well, why should we be ashamed of being judgmental in this? Oh, no, don't ask me. I've <laughs> <laughs> just said it's a personal preference. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's all it boils down to. Personal preference. I prefer to do philosophy. Yeah. Then, and therefore, because I, yeah, because I judge, I'm a competent judge, philosophy is better than having enough after lunch. No, I, I, I think Churchill was a competent judge and he, 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 he had wrote books. Lunch. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but he also built a wall and he got great pleasure out of that. Mm. Now, are we denying? But that doesn't mean he didn't get as maybe, well, building a wall is maybe a higher pleasure, I don't know. Uh, now you're twisting terms. No, no, not yeah, necessarily. No, I, no, you tell me what comes into a higher moving, pleasure you're rather than. You're, you're moving things around the categories, aren't you, really? No. <laughs> oh, can you define it then? What? Ah, oh, I mean, um, you, you define. I am going to in just a minute. I, 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 I happen to like ballet and I don't like opera, but I can believe that opera is possibly a higher pleasure than ballet. Oh, but I can make that <laughs> We're getting into hotter and hotter water here, aren't we? <laughs> okay. whether, um, whether it is or not, who's to say? I mean, uh, the answer is a competent judge. Anyone capable of experiencing both higher and lower pleasures would never agree to have only the higher pleasures, says Mill. Socrates dissatisfied is better than a pig or, or a fool satisfied. OK, let me tell you my gloss on this. You, you, it may change your mind or you may completely disagree with it. You're all immediately assuming that Mill's a nasty old Victorian elitist, or some of you are. Some of you are. No, OK, Erica's not, but some of you are. <laughs> um, the gloss I put on it is this. Think of the difference between us and animals um, and also us and non-rational human beings, in other words, very young children. Well, actually, no, I'm going to include young children in this. Um, what we can do and they can't do is form plans for ourselves, form strategies by which to implement those plans and then exercise tenacity and self-discipline in implementing those plans and achieving those ends. Now, that, that uh, ability, which is not shared by animals, is had by even somebody, a child of five, who learns to tie their two shoelace. OK, so the child, those of you who have had children and have seen a child learn to tie its shoelace, what does the child feel? Huge joy, isn't it? The first time it succeeds, having tried, tried, failed, got frustrated, tried again and succeeded. Um, and that, I think, 
is maybe a gloss on what Mill's saying. He's not talking about higher and lower pleasures in terms of the way we might think of things as, as elitist pleasures. What he's thinking of as higher pleasures is the sort of pleasures that human beings can have when they succeed in, in doing something that they want to do, that they've tried hard to do. Do you see how it becomes quite Aristotelian at that point? Um, because you've got, to, you've got to have form a goal for yourself, you've got to make the plan by which to achieve the goal, then you've got to implement that plan. And to implement the plan, it, it may involve quite a lot of self-discipline. So if I want to buy that ball gown, I've got to... Sorry, if I want to buy that house, I've got to not buy all the ball gowns that I want to buy in between. Goodness, that's a very old example that I used to use when I was teaching undergraduates 20 years ago. It just shows you, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, but that is the sort of pleasure that Mill's talking about, not the pleasure of a philosophy lecture versus a bingo hall. It's the, the pleasure of the sort of thing that a pig gets pleasure from, having a nap after lunch, uh, having a big lunch, having an enjoyable lunch, um, and the sort of thing that a human being can do, which is learn to do something it couldn't do before, and the pleasure that comes from that is what the higher pleasure is, not the pleasure that comes from the things that we share with pigs. What about the sheepdog herding the sheep? The young sheepdog gets obviously an enormous pleasure. Okay, if, if animals are it's capable... strategy and it's plan. Okay, if, if animals are capable of that, then they too can have higher pleasures. I don't think we need to make a, a, a set and dry thing about what can and can't have higher pleasures. But I'm just giving you a different sort of account of higher and lower pleasures that doesn't lead to Mills being elitist in the way that the first one does. Do you see? No, I don't. I don't. Well, I what's think a pig's <laughs> nap might, might give it exquisite pleasure because a pig's... A and you really don't think that, that a human being gets more pleasure from... I mean, because a human being can have a nap as well. I would, but I can't speak for another human being or an, another animal. I can't. I can't make that jump. And, and, and you don't think that a human being who chose to spend their whole life napping when they could do better than that, you don't think there's something a bit yeah, missing there? If that's their choice. You know, right, OK. That, that's fine. But that, that is the objection to Mill. Um, the objection to Mill is there's no such thing as higher and lower pleasures. There's just pleasure, full stop. And all that matters is the quantity. And you're with Bentham on this, and Bentham is a, is a perfectly respectable philosopher, so there's nothing wrong with your view. <laughs> That's a really... There's well, I was just saying, oh, this bit self-indulgent. Uh, it, it, it's what, what, what Mill thought you were trying to get across. Not when we agree with each other. Sorry, say that the sense again. It's what Mill is thinking that you're trying to get across. It's not when we agree with each other. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what I try and do is put across what Mill said first and then what he might have meant second. Uh, I don't say that is what Mill meant. Um, clearly, a lot of people have thought that that's not what Mill meant, that he meant more the opera versus the bingo hall uh, higher pleasures. But, but I think whether Mill meant what I suggested or not, you can take what I suggested as an interpretation of higher and lower pleasures. And for me, it takes away the feeling of elitism that the former perhaps we'll give you. Anyway, let's, let's move on. Um, so that's the ambiguity with, with happiness and whether we're talking about quantity or quality of happiness. Now let's look at the ambiguity about action types and action tokens. If we say, now you know this distinction from the first week again. Do you remember we talked about um, particularism? And we looked at type, token actions, which is a, a particular action at a particular time, which is done by a particular person at a particular time, particular day, etc., and has all sorts of descriptions of it. Um, there is no other action that's identical to a token action. It would have to be an identical action, and that won't happen. Um, so if we say that lie is wrong, we're talking about a token lie and we're saying of that token lie that it's wrong. If we say lying is wrong, we're committing ourselves to the belief that all lies are wrong. And of course, there are lots of different sorts of lies. There's the lie I tell you when, when I say it's Tuesday. There's the one um, I tell you when I rub my nose, having agreed with you that I'll rub my nose only at half past three. 
Okay, so if I do that, I'm lying now, aren't I? If I do it intentionally, I'm c wanting to cause you to believe it's half past three. So there's rubbing my nose, one lie. There's telling you it's Tuesday, another lie, etc. So lots of different lies. And we're thinking of lying as a type of action, not as a, as a token action. So in the terminology of lecture one, the... Second claim here, lying is wrong is a generalist claim, and the first claim is a particularist claim. Okay, any questions about that before we move on? Very important you understand the difference between types and tokens. Yep, good. Um, a particularist utilitarian is called an act utilitarian. Uh, the act utilitarian checks each token action against the greatest happiness of the greatest number. So before performing any particular act, um, an act utilitarian, if he's a very good one, um, is going to think, is this act such that it produces the greatest happiness of the greatest number? See what I mean? He checks it directly against the greatest ha happiness principle. Um, the rule utilitarian doesn't do that. Uh, he's a generalist utilitarian, he's a rule utilitarian, and he uses the greatest happiness principle to check action types and then checks action tokens against the rules that this generates. So he'll ask himself, um, OK, what about lying? Does lying tend to produce... Do you see where this is where the tend to produce comes in? Does lying tend to produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number? Well, it doesn't, does it? Um, so you have a, a general rule, don't lie, because lying doesn't produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number. And then when you come to a particular action, to see that that action is a lie is to see that it falls under the rule don't lie and to see that you shouldn't perform it. So do you see the difference between the act utilitarian and the, the um, rule utilitarian? The rule utilitarian has a two-step procedure the act utilitarian has a one-step procedure for checking um, the, the rightness and wrongness of actions. Any questions about that before we move on? No? Okay. Is, is the basis of that, that um, the last one, is the basis of that uh, that it's more likely to have good consequences? Do you follow what I mean? No. If 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 we if we check if we're, with raw consequentialism, mm -hmm. it's the basis of that. I mean, I, I can see logically you can spout the basis out there, but it's a it, it's also the argument that you're likely to have better consequences. Um, the argument is that it's only the consequences of a of an action that matter. But the rule utilitarian is concerned about the consequences of action types rather than the consequences. Well and the consequences of action tokens, but it measures the, the um, consequences of action types against the consequences of action tokens. Um, whereas rule util uh, act utilitarian cuts out that middle step. Um, so rule utilitarian has seemed attractive to some um, because act utilitarian can only recognise rules of thumb, um, so rules based on past experience. So if in your experience lying has nearly always ended in tears, um, then the rule don't lie is for an act utilitarian a useful reminder of that. But, but the rule don't lie has no more status than that. It's just a rule of thumb, it's just based on your past experience, so Utilitarianism is actually an inductive morality. It says that we get moral rules from our experience, from observation and experience, which is very definitely not Kant's belief. Kant believes that, that moral judgments are a priori, made without experience, whereas for a utilitarian, you have to have experience in order to make moral judgments. So um, act utilitarianism can only recognise rules of thumb, uh, and it can't give moral rules like that any more status than that. Um, so when lying would clearly promote the greatest happiness, the greatest number, the act utilitarian gets, just goes straight ahead and lies. So um, another example here is um, Jim and the Indians. Put your hand up if you've heard of this. 
Oh, good. Am I telling it for the first time? I can't believe it. Okay, Jim and the Indians. There's Jim, who's an anthropologist who's been travelling through the jungle and unfortunately he gets captured by a um, bandolero. Does that sound convincing? Anyway, you know what I mean. Some sort of big... They're in South America and he's some sort of bigwig in South America and he's already got 20 Indians captive. And he says, look, I can see you're a, you're a big white man sort of thing. I'm going to give you a gun and what I want you to do is to shoot one of these Indians and then we're going to le we'll let the others go. But if you don't shoot one of them, I'm going to shoot all of them. Now, if you're an act utilitarian, some people say, Jim should just see immediately that it's right to shoot the one, uh, one Indian, take out the gun and shoot him. But most of us would say it doesn't work like that. <laughs> Um, even if, on reflection, it does seem right to shoot the one Indian, um, it surely isn't obviously right, is it? It's surely not something that we're, we're going to say, Phew, all right, I did the right thing. You know, I don't have any guilt, I don't have any problem with that because the numbers were right, I've done it. Um, and it looks as if utilitarianism, uh, the act utilitarian rather, can't, can't explain that failure of integrity, we might say, um, because it really does look to us that even if in the end we do decide it's right to shoot the Indian, it still doesn't seem right, obviously, in the way it should be if act utilitarianism is right. Um, so... A lot of people have thought that the trouble with that utilitarianism it, is it doesn't give moral rules like don't lie, don't kill, etc. the right moral force. It doesn't give them enough moral force. So certainly um, the rules, moral rules for an act utilitarian don't have deontological force, but actually they don't even have more force than um, a rule of thumb. And we do sometimes think that rules have de deontological force. Or really, I, Actually, I'm wishing here I hadn't put deontological force, but certainly we want to say they, they have more force than that. I mean, who agrees with me that it's not obviously right to shoot the Indian, even if it is right to shoot the Indian? OK, and why do we think that? Because actually the rule don't kill is pretty deeply embedded in us, isn't it? And also, what about if I could... Um, Volker. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I got it that time. OK, sadly, Volker... Well, no, actually, it's not sad. It's, it's great. Volker is the only healthy one in this row of one, two, three, four, five, six people here. The rest of you are doddery. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> da -da -da -da. But I could make you all healthy by killing him and taking out his various organs and handing them on to you. Now, shouldn't I do that? <laughs> what do you think, Volker? <laughs> no, no, they all think it's fine, I'm asking you. OK, again, we've got something where it looks as if, um, and obviously this is a pretty knee-jerk example, and you, we need to ask lots more questions about this because actually we'd all feel pretty uncomfortable and not very happy if we thought that that was something that might happen at any moment, isn't it? So you can ask questions about this, but on the surface of it, it looks as if I ought to kill Volker, give his organs to you lot, uh, therefore produce six happy people where before there was only one. The, the only thing I'm saying is that it's one against six and the utilitarian on the surface of it, and I really stress on the surface of it, looks as if they're going to answer, I should sacrifice Volker. And yet we actually don't, we don't think that, do we, at all? We think it's utterly wrong to, to kill Volker in order to, to make six of you healthier. Um, and that's because our moral rules have much more force, at least on the surface, than the act utilitarian seems to give them. Is this the difference between to kill and to let die? Uh, well, no. I mean, it comes in here. You might say that um, uh, killing is one thing, letting die is another. Um, but actually that's irrelevant to what I'm talking about. These six people you're going to cure, you're letting them die, whereas you're killing Volker. Um, if I don't kill Volker to save, save them, I'm letting them die. Yes, and you might think that I'm not 
um, responsible for that. But, but that is a different matter. All I'm talking about here is I want you to see that the act utilitarian would say that if the numbers come out right, we, then our moral rules are, are irrelevant. We, we just go ahead and do whatever it is that the numbers tell us to do. Um, and that is the right action. And it leaves a lot of people with a rather uncomfortable feeling that we're not giving proper honour to, to our intuition that it's wrong to kill, that it's wrong to lie, etc. I wanted to ask about experience and judgment. Um, you mentioned experience in the room. Mm -hmm. Can you speak up a bit? Well, we were forgetting the experience of judgment in that because you should delay for the individual to practice their judgment to decide whether eventually you could preserve them all. Um, well, it might be that if I don't kill Vulcan now, you're all going to die by tomorrow. I might not have the time. But how would you know that? Oh, I'm a very experienced doctor. <laughs> <laughs> As you know. <laughs> I mean, you notice I'm going to perform this operation. Be afraid, be very afraid. <laughs> There was a question here somewhere. No? OK. Thank you. Right. OK. So we do sometimes think that rules have deontological force. OK. This is the one that I think you were talking about earlier. Was it you or you? I can't remember. Anyway, have a look at this. Actually, I'm going to read it out to you for the uh, sake of the people on the podcast. Hello, everyone on the podcast. Uh, OK. This is a possible counterexample to utilitarianism. Do you remember I said that we need to see, are there any actions that are right but that don't produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number, or that are wrong and do produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number. And here's a possible counterexample. The populace of a small US town are living in fear because of a series of horrific rape murders. The newly appointed, but not yet trusted, sheriff knows the culprit is dead because he shot him, but no one saw him do this, him, the sheriff, do this, and the body fell into a fast-flowing river and disappeared. So he can't now prove that he shot him. But last week, the sheriff locked up a vagrant who is suicidal, really wants to die, uh, claiming to have lost his whole family, all his possessions, all his friends, etc., in a disaster. So nobody cares whether he lives or dies either. Um, what the sheriff thinks, if he finds proof, and notice the scare quotes around it here, uh, that the vagrant committed the crime, obviously there must be scare quotes around the proof because the vagrant didn't commit the crime uh, but he tries convicts and hangs him this will make everyone happy won't it it'll get everyone off his back it'll make all the populace of this small town happy uh, it'll also make the tramp happy because he wants to die um, clearly it's the right thing to do isn't it well is it why not Sorry, which, what's morally wrong? If the sheriff knows the, the culprit he shot... The other one. ...was really the culprit, and he, if he's certain of that, then it's morally wrong to accuse the other one. Why? Because, after all, um, we're showing that what the sheriff's doing here is producing the greatest happiness the greatest number, aren't we? And utilitarianism says that the right action is the action that produces the greatest happiness to the greatest number. Because it doesn't tend to, though, because if there are a million examples, then there are enough times he'd be found out and get back to the whole problem with lying and the fact that he was this thing too. Well, I've sort of tried to push enough into this to make it very unlikely he's going to be found out. I mean, can you find a way of, in which he might be found out? I mean, does that matter anyway? I mean, if nobody ever finds out, they will be made happier. It's true that if anyone found out, they, they wouldn't be happier, but he's, he's got to make a decision, and it certainly it looks pretty foolproof, doesn't it? It goes against an idea of justice, though, doesn't it? It's, I mean, there's a, there's a, the concept of justice that we, that we have that this doesn't address. Goodness, you are all deontologists, aren't you? I, I think I should have taken a different tack on this. <laughs> well, because they don't trust him. He's a new sheriff. 
and and the body went into the river i mean it obviously he's just going to say that the other chap did it isn't he because he wants to do you see what i mean yeah. so nobody's going to believe him if he tries to convince he's them that And do you think his unhappiness... In, no, let, let's say that the sheriff is just not that sort of guy. <laughs> He's the sort of person who can take out his gun and shoot an Indian without even thinking about it. You don't want to terrify that. I'm going to argue it is the right thing to do. Just OK, you think it is the right thing to do. I, I think the earlier example you gave, I think the chap has no choice except to shoot one Indian. Oh, so it's not here's the right thing to do, but... No, here's the right thing to do. Here's the right thing to do and as well, and in the, and the Indian one. Good, I'm glad we've got at least one utilitarian here. <laughs> okay, you, you, so you too think it goes against our feeling of justice. It goes, okay, this is... On a utilitarian basis, I mean, clearly, obviously, it's... It is, I mean, it is... Uh, the right thing to do, but, it, it, but the reason why it doesn't is, is there are... Okay, I'm feeling slightly distressed here because um, <laughs> I feeling I've given you the impression now that utilitarianism is, is obviously wrong, and this is not what I intended to do. I mean, what... what sh hang on just a second. Every single week what I've tried to do is present the strongest possible case for each moral theory I've done. Now, you should know that I can't embrace them all, so you should know that I'm not giving you what I believe. Um, but what I am trying to do is... And the thing about utilitarianism, the examples I've given you may not be right, but what about this? Um, in the war, Churchill, and I understand this is a true story, um, there were bombers coming over, and the decision was made to distract them and make them drop their bombs on a small village in the co on the coast as opposed to London. Um, I'm, I'm sure I've got the details wrong. Assume I've got the details wrong. I'm not claiming any historical accuracy here. But what would Churchill have been right to have done that? To have dropped the bombs on the small village as opposed to have dropping, the, dropping the bombs on London, where they would have led to many, many more lives being lost, many, many more people being... If he was a utilitarian, he'd be right. He's judged by... Now, hang on, my intuitions at this point think, yes, Churchill was right. And here's another time when I think it would have been right, perhaps, to act on a utilitarian belief. So, and this is also a true story, a ship uh, on fire off the coast of Australia, four people in the engine room, um, hundreds of sailors on the ship. The only way of stopping the fire was to cut off the oxygen in the engine room, thereby killing the four sailors in the engine room, uh, but saving the other hundreds of sailors on the ship. Should the captain have turned off the oxygen or not? Who thinks he should? So, you see, you have got some utilitarian <laughs> intuitions here. Um, sometimes numbers do count, don't they? What do you think the difference is here? Why, why is it not acceptable to kill Volker to keep these six people alive, but it is acceptable to kill the four sailors on the ship or, actually, the four sailors on the ship might have died anyway or would have died anyway, but let's go back to the Churchill example. Why is it OK to, to bomb the small village instead of the larger village? Let's make it easier. I, I, I registered as true. I don't, I don't go. I don't know. OK, but lots of people thought it was. So, so of the people who thought it was... OK, but what, what about the um, London and the smaller village? Yeah, I think you would count. You, you would say it's simply on, on in quantity. We could make the proportions equal. Here it's one to six. So let's say there are 100 people in the small village and 600 people who would have been killed in London. So the proportions are, are the same. And we know for sure that the 600 will die unless you kill the 100. Does that change your mind? It might well, no, let, let's leave complications like that out of it. Do we know 
know for sure. Can we always predict? Uh, no, we don't know for sure. Clearly, clearly we don't. But, but we were supposing that we could know for sure just here. And I was saying, let's say we could know for sure. What we're doing here is we're spinning the possible worlds. We're trying different thought experiments to see why sometimes our intuitions are for utilitarianism and sometimes they're not. And I'm slightly afraid in the way I presented it before, I, I was bringing out all your anti-utilitarian intuitions, especially having exercised all your Kantian ones last week. Um, and I just want to redress the balance. Actually, we do have very strong utilitarian intuitions. I mean, let's go back to qualies, actually. Um, the decisions about healthcare spending are huge and they are really difficult. Um, biotechnology is advancing at such a rate that every time you get a new technology, you get another million people immediately on the waiting list. The waiting lists are expanding um, the, and the money was well, even smaller than it was last year. Um, there's uh, hard decisions have to be made. How are we supposed to make those decisions? Actually, Qualies, as a way of making them, how else do you make them? Do you say instead, um, well, okay, anyone who's older um, should not get treatment? You could say that. You could say anyone who's um, not mentally competent or not physically fit doesn't get treatment. You could say that. That's another one. You could say anyone who's contributed to their own uh, ill health shouldn't get it. So smokers shouldn't get lung transplants and so on. Um, all these things have quite big objections to them. Qualies is at least an attempt to make an objective decision, an impartial decision as to who should get what treatment. And actually, the, one, the thing about utilitarianism is that's what it's doing. It's, it's an attempt to be impartial. It uses the same universalizing elements as Kantianism does, actually. Can anyone tell me how it does that? How, do, how is utilitarian a universalizing creed in the same way that Kantianism is? Can anyone think why that might, how that might work? It's a rationalistic thing? Is it, is it the fact that um, both are supposedly come from a rational basis? Are... No, because one comes from a demonstrative or deductive basis, an a priori basis, and the other from an inductive or probabilistic basis. Utilitarianism is an inductive basis. Creed. Actually, what it is, is it, again, the greatest happens to the greatest number. Um, the decision you make is supposed to be impartial, isn't it? You're looking at everyone and you're saying, you know, my action must make for the greatest happiness of the greatest number. I mustn't consider myself. I mustn't put myself or those I love first. So there's the same universalizing element in it. It seems to me sometimes that to make the correct decision in the case you've got on the screen, you're, you're making something that's very, very difficult and could leave you, yourself, very unhappy about it. That doesn't mean to say it's the wrong decision. Well, that, somebody else also said that. Well, absolutely. I mean, if you like, if you see Churchill as the name of the sheriff here, haven't we got structurally exactly the same decision? So should we say to Churchill that he shouldn't have done that? He should have just left the planes alone to come and do whatever they were going to do with London rather than take action that it guaranteed that they were going to kill the 100 people in the village. Isn't, isn't that doing the same thing as the sheriff would do if he hanged the tramp? And if you think it's okay in Churchill's case, why don't you think it's okay here? Now, that's the really interesting philosophical question. And that's the question you need to go away and think about because what you're doing here, you've got two structurally similar cases and, and your intuition's coming out yes in one case and no in the other. So there must be something different about them. And what you need to do is to work out what those differences are why the two situations bring out different intuitions. But let's move on, because we've only got five minutes. Um, OK, if the uh, act utilitarian is happy to break rules every time he thinks it'll promote the greatest happiness of the greatest number, then doesn't he fail... We've done this. Doesn't he fail to recognise the proper force and moral rules? 
And rule utilitarian enables the utilitarian to insist that utilitarianism does recognise the proper, and I wish I hadn't put deontological, so scrub that out, proper force of everyday moral rules. We should always tell the truth because generally speaking, truth telling promotes the greatest happiness of the greatest number. But, okay, so that's the argument for rule utilitarian, is, is it, it satisfies those intuitions that you all had really very strongly that, that justice wasn't um, done by hanging the innocent tramp in the cells. Um, but it has been collapsed, claimed that rule utilitarian collapses into act. Um, a rule utilitarian has three possible responses uh, he could make to the situation in which the greatest happiness, the greatest number, demands that a rule be broken, doesn't he? Either he should keep the rule, or he should break the rule, or he should modify the rule. So the, here's a rule, don't lie. And he comes across the situation in which the Nazis are asking, are there any Jews here? Well, what's he going to do? Is he keep, going to keep the rule? He's going to refuse to lie? Or, no, no, don't give me an answer. I'm just going through the options. Uh, or he could break the rule. He could just um, tell a lie. Or he could modify the rule. He, said, he could say something like, well, OK, you should tell the truth or, am I right? Except in circumstance C. OK, well, the trouble with this is, if the rule utilitarian keeps the rule, then isn't he a deontologist masquerading as a utilitarian? Um, do you see what I mean? If, if he keeps the rule, even when it would obviously produce the greatest happiness, greatest number to break it, he's a deontologist, really, isn't he? Um, if he breaks the rule, isn't he treating the rule as a rule of thumb and he's really just an act utilitarian, isn't he? So what if he modifies the rule? That's the only one that's going to make any difference between act and rule utilitarianism. So imagine he modifies the rule to read, do A except in circumstance C. And the next time he meets an exception, he's going to modify it again to read, do A except in circumstance C and C1. I can see that you, you can see where I'm going. In, in effect, the rule utilitarian is only going to perform exactly those actions which an act utilitarian is going to perform, isn't he? And if that's so, there's not really any difference between them, is there? Um, so, I mean, they, they come out to be exactly the same thing. Um, so they're, they're um, extensional equivalents, but intentional non-equivalents, for those of you who, who know the jargon. Usually I would explain that to you, but I'm not going to. We'll do it next week if you're really interested. So on this story, the RU is never going to actually act differently from an act utilitarian. So how can his theory count as different? It can't, really. But the collapse of RU into AU can be resisted by recognition of these two things. And what I'm going to give you now is a very short canter through a paper called by a chap called John Rawls, whom you've already heard of. Um, called Two Concepts of Rules, which is a really good paper. Um, and if you get a chance, do read it. Um, if we recognise that different people play different roles in respect of rules, and we recognise that there are two sorts of rules in everyday life, then we can see that rule utilitarian can be saved from the collapse. And here's how we do it. Um, a legislator... OK, so somebody in the Houses of Parliament has got to decide whether a certain laws should be made and certain practices introduced. OK, um, but a judge, once the law has been made, the judge doesn't look uh, to anything but the law itself, does he? So, so the MP or whoever um, is deciding, well, should we have a law um, that there should be identity cards or something like that. But once there is a law introduced that we must carry identity cards and you end up in court for not carrying one, the judge can't say, well, should we carry identity cards or not? Yes, uh, this is not his job, is it? 
what he's thinking of is, did this person not carry an identity card? Is there a law that says you must carry an identity card? If the answer to those things is both yes, then you are guilty. Um, so the legislator looks directly to the greatest happiness principle to decide which laws will produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. So he's acting as an act utilitarian. See what I mean? And the, once the law is introduced, the judge looks to the law, not to the greatest happiness principle. So he acts as a rule utilitarian. So it's very easy when rule utilitarian and act utilitarian are introduced to think that either you're one or the other. But actually, that's not true at all. It doesn't work that way. Um, the judge, when he's um, wearing his legislator's hat, as he does occasionally, is acting as an act utilitarian, not a rule utilitarian. See what I mean? It, it depends on what his role in society is. Also, in everyday life, there are two sorts of rules. There are rules that summarise past decisions made in particular cases. So, if I've seen every time I've told a lie, it's led to tears, usually mine, um, I'm going to start thinking, OK, don't lie is a good rule. That's, that's a summary rule. Do you see what I mean? It's based on inductive evidence. But then there are also rules that define a practice, um, and that must be treated as a practice. So, say that um, uh, Ros and I decide to play chess. OK, having decided we'll play chess, I've decided that my king's going to be able to move right across the board and take your queen. OK, well, that's not on, is it? No. no, because once I've taken on the practice of playing chess, I also take on the rules and I can no longer um, decide myself what the rules are. So in the same way, you don't have to marry, but if you do marry, you take on certain rules um, that, that you are then bound by and so on. Um, so a summary rule can be broken whenever the greatest happiness principle suggests that it should be, but a, um, anyone acting on a summary rule is going to be acting as an act utilitarian. Um, but one who chooses to adopt a practice that's governed by rules thereby commits himself to looking to the rules to decide what to do, not directly to the greatest happiness of the greatest number, so he's got to act as a rule utilitarian. So often in life, we act as rule utilitarians. Often in life, we oft act as, as act utilitarians. And when we're wearing different hats in different parts of our lives, we are committed to acting as one or the other. So actually, there's, rules are a lot more complicated than the traditional dichotomy between rule utilitarian and act utilitarianism would have us believe. So it's far more complicated than we might have thought. Okay, we're going to, this I can do very quickly because I've actually already done it in reply to something down there. What would a utilitarian have to say about the truth of the claim dropping the bomb on Hiroshima was the right thing to do? What would they have to say? They wouldn't have to say anything, would they? Because um, all they'd have to say is if dropping the bomb led to the greatest happiness of the greatest number, then it was right. If dropping the bomb didn't lead to the greatest happiness of the greatest number, then it was wrong. And so utilitarianism is, if, if you like, a decision procedure, not a decision made. So we'll never know whether it's true or false, whether dropping the bomb was the right thing to do or not, but that doesn't mean that it isn't either true or false. The utilitarian can be a moral realist, is a moral realist, usually. Um, the fact that makes moral statements true or false are not independent of us. If there were no conscious subjects, there wouldn't be any happiness, would there? But do you remember I said in answer to a question recently, there are objective facts about subjective states of affairs, aren't there? So um, either... John, isn't it? Mike. Mike, sorry, you're John. Yeah. Uh, either Mike believes that Marion's wearing a red dress or he doesn't. OK? If he, it's an objective fact about Mike that either he believes that or not. But his belief that I'm wearing a red dress is a subjective state, isn't it? It's a state of Mike's as a subject. So, so we mustn't confuse um, objective and subjective uh, in an unhelpful way, obviously. <laughs> OK. So um, 
the fact that the facts that make true the claims about right and wrong are not entirely uh, facts about sorry that don't involve subjects does not make the utilitarian an anti-realist okay what's all this about okay this is a bit about the utilitarian is an inductivist he he forms his beliefs about right or wrong on in observation and induction not as kant would have it a priori there we are there you are, and that's where, that's where I'm going to end. I'm five minutes late. Questions to test your understanding. And there's no reading for next week because what you're going to do next week is you are going to do the work and you're going to come. I might give a, a brief introduction and just a summary of things, but you're going to ask me questions and we're going to look at all the theories. And the, the point of next week is to really try and draw the different strands together because we've, looked through a, we've had a canter through a lot of theories um, and we need to draw the strands together and try and make sense of what we've been thinking about. Okay, so that's next week. Come armed with lots of questions.